good afternoon friends namaskar namaste uh, such a delight for me to welcome uh, each one of the participants to this event uh, this is uh, uh, this is world investor week 2022 the sebi has directed all the exchanges and all the training institutions uh, to conduct a series of events during this world investor week starting from october 10th till october 16th and we have already done uh, three events so far and i'm sure more are in the offing uh, a banner from sebi says investor resilience a smart investor conducts research before investing and diversifies his portfolio extremely important i think for all investors in commodity derivatives or any asset for that matter uh, the investor has to be resilient investor has to be smart investor has to uh, have adequate commercial intelligence he must do enough research before he invests and of course diversifying one's portfolio is extremely important now allow me just one moment to share screen anita you have to allow me to share screen okay all right <clears throat> all right so let, let's from the beginning let let's go ahead okay uh, so this is this uh, during the world investor week 2022 we are here imc chamber of commerce and industry and mcx we are jointly conducting uh, a webinar with the theme commodities as an asset class in an inflationary environment and all of us know the current environment is inflationary and it has been inflationary for the last uh, several months importantly I, i must mention to this audience that the imc chamber of commerce and industry is a sebi accredited sebi recognized training institution for commodity derivatives and in this capacity as a sebi recognized training institution we do a lot of events to create awareness about commodity derivatives market about risk management and do a number of training and education programs and this today's and we have a relationship going with mcx for the last four or five years we have done numerous events both in person and and virtual and this is a part of that ongoing relationship between mcx and imc and then and today we are going to be discussing uh, my the theme of my presentation is commodities as an investment asset during inflation we also have uh, mr madan sabnave is well known economist uh he is also a part of the sebi's commodity derivative advisory committee uh he writes uh, in various business papers wonderful columns is followed very very closely by people uh, uh by by readers and currently is chief economist with bank of baroda and uh, someone who who as an economist knows the market like the back of his hand we also have nazir from uh, mcx who will who will share his thoughts from an exchange perspective he will he will talk so i want to welcome my co panelists my co speakers uh, for for this event thank you very much for joining let's go okay i think this is a slide which has already been shown and and before I'll, i'll i'll skip and we have talked about it i'll go to the go to my first slide why are we discussing commodities uh, that that's most important but before that let me again also mention as part of this world investor week 2022 the imc chamber of commerce and industry actually uh, took a delegation of 20 members uh, to to visit it was on the 11th of october uh, to visit the india international exchange and india international bullion exchange uh, uh, in 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 amdabad and the, the purpose of the delegation was to evaluate opportunities for investment in new product and and, and, and new uh, new avenues for investment and imc delegation was led by imc president mr anand singhania and therefore you you can imagine the amount of interest that uh, this world investor week uh, has generated and will continue to generate and how chambers of commerce uh, are taking uh, a lot of interest in uh, in exploring this this area now uh, this is this is uh, one of my favorite slides which i which i show uh, in a number of conferences when we discuss commodities uh, these in my view are india's major growth sectors for the future 
over the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, these are sectors which are going to grow. And in whatever manner you may be associated with any of these sectors, your business also will grow. Is, is, is my conviction. And what are these sectors? Okay, let me go to the bottom three. Healthcare, education, and leisure. Leisure and entertainment. In healthcare, education, and leisure are services. Okay? And these, uh, these are certainly going to grow in future because the penetration of our healthcare service still leaves, uh, leaves something to be desired. The penetration of our education service also uh, uh, leave something to be desired. Same with, with, with leisure and entertainment. The first five sectors, which I have very consciously put them in capital letters, as you can see, cover agriculture and food, textiles and clothing, housing and infrastructure, energy and transportation or mobility. Now, these are going to be the growth sectors because India, uh, India, has to consume, given the size of the population, given the, uh, uh, the, the rising incomes and the potential for rising incomes in future, and considering the current low per capita availability of food, India's demand for food will continue to grow. And therefore, when India's demand for food continues to grow, uh, obviously, those associated with this sector have got to understand the agriculture commodity markets, the dynamics of the agriculture commodity markets, the drivers of the agriculture commodity market. This is extremely important. The second one is textiles and clothing. Uh, and therefore, we, our food and agriculture sector will continue to grow and it will grow until we reach a situation where we can claim that the food needs of people are by and large satisfied. We are not there yet, certainly. And the sec next one is textiles and clothing. Again, huge, very big sector, huge export potential. Uh, Indians are, Indians are, uh, uh, Indians uh, 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 have started to consume textiles and clothing uh, in, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a very large scale. And the future for this, this textiles and clothing sector is, uh, is very bright and it is going to be expansionary. And when you talk of textiles and clothing, and if you are associated with this sector in any way, you got to understand fiber, because fiber is a raw material for textiles and clothing. Uh, whether it is cotton or jute or silk or synthetic fibers, you've got to understand, uh, 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 when, when you are associated with this sector, you've got to understand commodity, fiber, which is a commodity, whether it's a natural, uh, natural fiber like uh, jute and cotton or synthetic fiber. So that's, that's again very important. Third one is housing and infrastructure. At any point of time, India is short of at least 50 million dwelling houses. And this, this is likely to continue. And therefore, construction of dwelling houses is, is, will continue to be big business into the foreseeable future. Same with infrastructure, whether it is uh, railways, roadways, uh, uh, airport, seaport, uh, or urban infrastructure, rural infrastructure, we are going to be spending extraordinary amounts of money, trillions of dollars over the next 15, 20, 30 years to, to upgrade uh, infrastructure and, and also build new infrastructure. And I'm sure all of us know and appreciate the fact that in any housing or infrastructure project, up to 70%, 65 to 70%, of the cost of the project is actually accounted for by commodities. The steel, it is cement, it is copper, it is aluminium, and and and, and related uh, other related commodities. For when we are discussing trillions of dollars of investment in housing and investment infrastructure, uh, obviously, come it will have a very big implication for the commodity energy. Energy fuels economic growth. They've got to burn. We've got to use energy to keep our wheels of growth uh, moving, uh, moving forward, uh, whether it is crude oil or natural gas or coal uh, uh, or biofuels or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, even uh, uh, or, or other forms of uh, electricity, for example, uh, uh, all uh, nuclear energy, uh, et cetera, solar, wind, 
uh, all, all that that market and demand for that is going to grow and all these are commodities crude oil is a commodity natural gas is a commodity coal is a commodity in fact power itself is electricity itself is a commodity which is which is being traded and therefore that that's again uh, uh, something which is going to touch our lives on a daily basis and uh, and, and that uh, and it, it, it's 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 a massive commodity with with huge uh, huge potential uh, and particularly when we talk of uh, decarbonization and our commitment for uh, for decarbonization i think uh, the, the the entire energy sector is going to uh, going to rapidly change over time transportation mobility very very important i think uh, we uh, whether again it is roadways railways air uh, airways seaways uh, uh, internal uh, uh, movement, external movement outside the country, whatever, all all that is going to be commodity intensive. When we are moving towards electric mobility, electric vehicles, electric vehicles are metals intensive, and therefore that's going to have a big implication for commodity markets, particularly metals, industrial metals, and these metals, and some uh, rare metals like lithium, etc. Therefore. These five top five sectors are all commodity intensive sectors. And these five sectors are actually going to drive India's economic growth over the next 15, 20 to 30 years. Next, this is the commodity intensity of India's growth. Therefore, we have talked about this commodity intensity of India's growth. And this commodity basket, as far as India is concerned, uh, comprises energy. Uh, obviously, uh, all, all em energy in all its ramifications. All, all kinds of energy, uh, whether it's crude oil, gas, or uh, thermal energy via coal, uh, or hydroelectric power, uh, or biofuel, nuclear energy, solar, wind, all that. Uh, and and that, that is one. Uh, the other silo is metals. Whether it is industrial metals like steel, or um, uh, I, steel and iron ore, or precious, met, precious metal like gold, silver, platinum, palladium, then you have uh, base metals, aluminum, copper, zinc, lead, tin, etc. Uh, all that, 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 that's a third, uh, a third basket. Metals will have a very, very, very big role to play in our lives. They continue to play even now and in future, they'll also have a bigger role to play. And of course, agriculture. Whether it is grains like rice and wheat and pulses, four cereals or oil seeds and oils, uh, or cotton, sugar, spices, you name it, a major, major agriculture commodities. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, our our production, our consumption, our trade is going to expand, and all these are products of daily use. Okay, and, and as I as I said, I am a firm believer in the statement that our growth in the decades ahead will be commodity intensive and commodity driven. China, if you've been tracking for the last thirty years, China's growth and they had scorching growth rates of 11, 12, 13% some years was very significantly commodity driven. I think we are not there yet, but I think the direction is very clear. Our growth is also going to be significantly commodity driven. For India currently is a large producer of commodities, large processor of commodities, large consumer of commodities, large exporter of commodities, or large importer of commodities, wide varieties of commodities. Uh, and we will, this, this is going to expand. Our role uh, in the food market, in the fiber market, in the metals market, in the energy market, all this is going to expand uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the coming year. And therefore, therefore, we need adequate knowledge about commodity market. We need product knowledge and market knowledge. If, if we have to benefit uh, from this future growth trends, uh, we showed those uh, eight uh, growth sectors for India, of which five have commodity implication. Uh, I think we need to understand uh, the dynamics of the market. We need to understand the drivers of the market. And therefore, it is, in, it is important for all of us to gain adequate product knowledge and adequate uh, market knowledge about, about commodities. We need to track the dynamics of the market and the drivers, as I said earlier. More important is that Indian economy is integrating with the global economy. 
Indian markets are integrating with the global markets. And therefore, whatever happens in the global marketplace will impact the Indian marketplace. And therefore, we have to have a 360 degree vision of what is happening around us in the world. And of course, what's happening in our own country and, and, then, and then take uh, take your uh, trading decisions or investment decisions, etc. And therefore, we will be subject to India, will be subject to not only the domestic market influences, domestic supply and demand uh, fundamentals, but also global supply and demand fundamentals will impact will impact the Indian market. And this integration of the market, uh, Indian market with the global market is through the trade route and through the investment route. <clears throat> so coming to coming to our actual uh, the topic of uh, commodities as an asset class uh, in times of inflation, what are those various uh, asset classes that we have? Very quickly, of course, the major ones: equity, currency, bond, real estate, and in fact, these days in the la in recent years, even art. Art has become an asset class. People are investing in art. Uh, anyway, uh, they, they, these are major, major asset classes. Uh, now, commodities have also joined this gang of this group of asset classes. Uh, 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 at least, in uh, to the best of my knowledge, over the last 20 years or so, commodities are also now perceived uh, as an asset class. Usually, when we talk of uh, uh, of uh, uh, equities, we always think it's an investment asset class. And when we talk of commodities, we always perceive commodities as a consumption asset class. But in the last 20 years, there's a change, small change in perception. Commodities are not only consumption assets, there's no doubt at all, because we consume commodities, uh, but commodities uh, are also now, they lend themselves to, they are amenable to, uh, to, to, to investments. But in the last 20 years, uh, uh, commodities have become uh, investment assets, which is which is a welcome move, and uh, uh, huge huge uh, investment, uh, uh, huge capital flows into commodity markets, especially commodity derivatives. Uh, your uh, hedge funds and mutual funds, uh, pension funds across the world in developed markets actually invest a lot of a lot of money in uh, in commodity markets and benefit from from the uh, volatility or change in price of uh, of uh, specific commodity and therefore beyond hedging commodity derivatives are primarily meant for hedging the price risk for all the value chain participants who handle physical commodities but beyond hedging commodities also uh, have now become uh, in investment assets and therefore they they offer uh, a new uh, investment avenue for for those with uh, with adequate risk appetite. Now, why should you invest in commodity derivatives is a question uh, everybody keeps asking. One, one single important reason is at least in the last 20 years when you do the analysis, commodities have many times actually outperformed other, other investment assets. And if I, gold is a classic example, all of us know, say between the year 2001 and 2012, for 12 long years, year on year, gold prices increased double digit for 12 years. Can you imagine, I mean, you can imagine if you had invested in gold uh, those days, how, how much uh, the kind of uh, phenomenal returns it would have given. Crude oil, uh, again, another commodity which has given fantastic returns. Cotton uh, recently has given fantastic uh, uh, fantastic returns. The palm oil has given fantastic returns. Therefore, I think we need we need to have, of course, adequate product knowledge and market knowledge and risk appetite to be to to benefit from invest investing in in commodity derivatives. Importantly, commodities have not only often they have outperformed other assets, but commodities are a great portfolio diversifier. Uh, I think uh, don't put all the eggs in one basket is is a is, is an old proverb, old saying, and then therefore diversify your portfolio. Commodities could be one of the portfolio diversifiers. And gold, for example, is often uh, seen as a very good portfolio diversifier. It's also seen as a safe haven asset. It's seen as a as a as a as a hedge against inflation, etc. 
and more importantly uh, the world has been seeing witnessing geopolitical uncertainties from time to time and during these times of geopolitical uncertainties we have seen and we know that actually equities market go down people pull their money out of equity market and 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 uh, and invest in safe haven assets like uh, gold etc and therefore during times of uncertainty commodities attract uh, a greater uh, investment attention and the globally investor awareness has been rising over the last 20 years and huge funds flow into commodity derivatives now another reason uh, uh, what is important is market integrity and safety and and therefore it is, what is important is commodity derivative trade actually takes place in very well organized marketplace there are a very large number of participants the price discovery process is quite transparent when you are when someone is in the physical market a sells and b buys at a particular price a, a, a particular commodity nobody would know about anything about that transaction but in a commodity derivative transaction which is uh, obviously done through a recognized and licensed exchange uh, the information is available uh, the commodity name is available and the price at which the trade takes place is also available for the price discovery process for the market at large is quite transparent unlike in the unlike in the physical market and then of course there are several other advantages so we will probably not be able to touch all of them but most important is neutral platform an exchange provides a, an electronic platform which is neutral and uh, with uh, which ensures the uh, uh, trade uh, uh, anonymous trade uh, the the name of the buyer and seller will not be known at all and again no counterparty risk in a physical market there is a counterparty risk a is a seller b is a buyer uh, 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 b will always Uh, be worried that a may not supply or a will always be worried that b may not take delivery or make payment called a counterparty risk in an exchange traded derivatives contract uh, there is there is no counterparty risk at all and the ease of transaction ease of settlement daily mark to market these are these are uh, th- th- these systems and these processes and procedures ensure that the market's integrity remains remains quite high now it's important for us to understand also the regulatory oversight it's a three tier regulatory oversight uh, the top is the government of india which grants license to uh, commodity exchanges and sets the broad policy for the commodity derivatives market the next tier of regulator is sebi securities and exchange board of india which is an autonomous body uh, in india it is a super regulator because it regulates both equities and commodity derivatives market and it it it, uh, uh, it it regulates and oversees uh exchange activities it has a surveillance mechanism to ensure market integrity orderly trade and growth of the market exchange is a third level uh, exchanges are all called self regulatory organizations they provide a neutral electronic trading platform they provide standardized contracts and then they have been robust internal control system settlement delivery provisions etc all there and therefore i think we have a fairly good robust regulatory oversight as far as commodity derivative uh, derivatives are concerned for we have to now look at inflationary this is perhaps my last slide uh, inflationary environment why should we be trading commodity derivative and what is the, what is the significance now all of us know in the last two years we've had uh, 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 inflation has uh, uh, inflation has taken hold what were thought to be a transient uh, phenomenon uh, inflation has now become persistent and uh, governments and central bankers are actually fighting uh, to contain uh, inflation now there is a, there has been a combination of reason for 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 this inflation to Uh, to to take hold one is of course the very loose ultra loose monetary policy that i call uh, um, uh, uh, led by the united states of course quantitative easing and dropping of interest rates to near zero uh, levels and several other central bankers followed fiscal stimulus packages uh, 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 granted by 
uh, the various governments uh, primarily to uh, to uh, to to fight uh, the pandemic related uh, slowdown substantial slowdown uh, in in economic growth we have also seen supply disruption we have seen geopolitical instability we have seen uh, uh, weather problems la nina third now we are actually facing a triple dip la nina uh, last two years we have had la nina uh, which is impacted obviously south america uh, far worse than other countries uh, argentina brazil etc us faced problems uh, last year and even this year canada faced dry conditions last year so all, all that has also created supply shortages particularly of agriculture commodities and therefore all this has led to inflation high crude oil prices high food prices supply dislocation too much money uh, in in the economy and therefore uh, inflation has taken hold and it's obviously a major global issue current yes ba central banks uh, are all fighting now to to uh, to tighten the monetary policy to reduce liquidity to to raise interest rate they're all working and all of us know uh, various uh, various efforts oh, that are taking place but inflation actually hurts people inflation hurt businesses it raises production costs and it may certainly lead to a slowdown in demand uh, it uh, uh, it obviously uh, there could be a wage cost spiral uh, as a result of inflation it debases the currency value all all this we know these the downside risk uh, of uh, of uh, inflation particularly persistent inflation but for those in the commodity ecosystem uh, those in the in the uh, physical market and in the derivatives market rising commodity prices for that matter even falling commodity prices uh, actually offer a wonderful investment avenue uh, when you when the market has been rising and you want to invest in commodity derivative uh, it is important that you must have adequate product knowledge and market knowledge you should know what are the dynamics of the market you should know what are the drivers of the market and and then you must start you must start investing and more important in a rising market what is important is uh, 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 what is more important is that you must have an exit strategy in place entry you can make any time but you must have a very clear exit strategy when you want to invest uh, in commodity derivatives particularly in an inflationary environment because inflation is not going to be here forever it will be contained at some stage therefore you should know uh, when when to exit the market and, and and therefore i think with this with this i will stop thank you very much god bless you all my my mandatory disclaimer i am not a trader i don't hold any position either in the physical market or in the derivatives market i am a student of this market i am also often a teacher of this market and uh, uh, i will i'll continue to stay with all of you uh, thank you very much god bless i'm now going to invite our friend uh, madan sabnavis to share his thoughts madan's thoughts uh, are always uh, always very uh, 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 very erudite and therefore let us uh, let us hear madan's views yeah. uh, thanks a lot uh, chandrashekar for this very gracious uh, welcome to me to speak out here <clears throat> and uh, good afternoon or good evening to everyone I'm really going to take off from what uh, Chandrashekar has said because I think he has explained as to when you're talking of commodities as an asset class, has spoken of inflation, as to what exactly we should be uh, seeing. Now, I would like to talk of uh, talk on two particular issues. One is, of course, when you're looking at commodities as an asset class, I think it's become more alluring today given the kind of uh, uncertainty which we have in the environment. If you really go back to uh, 2019, I think things seem to be fairly bland, I would say, as far as commodities were concerned. Uh, 2020, we had uh, COVID, we had lockdown, we suddenly saw that commodity prices started coming down. We also had this absurd situation where oil price, the futures price actually went into the negative territory. And all of us are wondering as to how can it be a negative price for a particular commodity. And today, all of us are so scared that the price may go up to across 100, can go to 120. And I remember probably in the month of June, when the price crossed 120, we felt that it could also touch 150. 
And there are, of course, a lot of repercussions which are there uh, when commodity prices move up, because it's not just a case of higher inflation, but it also creates problems for monetary authorities, for governments. There has to be intervention by the government in order to take case, care of uh, vulnerable people. We also need to have monetary policy being a bit more aggressive to make sure that inflation is contained. And then we saw in 2021 that there was a sudden upsurge in prices. Prices went up because countries started recovering once the lockdowns were removed and all countries for, were on a high growth path. So the moment countries go on high growth path, automatically we see the commodity prices start increasing, which means that inflation tends to increase, it becomes globalized and everybody gets affected by it. Come to 2022, we have seen that uh, we started off with the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, subsequently, the war conditions have gotten exacerbated, not just in terms of the physical damage which has been caused, but because of supply disruptions. Uh, India, we always felt, would be unaffected by the war because we are friends of Russia. We don't have much to do with Ukraine. But suddenly, one fine day, we realized there's so much of interconnectedness in terms of uh, commodity prices, something which Chandrasekhar alluded to in the beginning of his presentation, that uh, Russia and Ukraine are large suppliers of uh, wheat in the global economy. So once we see that the supplies of wheat gets cut off from these two countries because of uh, logistics issues which are there, automatically we saw the price of uh, wheat go up. And when the price of wheat goes up, the immediate reaction was that, why should I as a farmer sell wheat to the Indian government? So the Ravi harvest was on. So then people felt that farmers felt let's sell in the open market. And therefore the government's procurement came down, the price of wheat went up. So wheat, which has generally been a very, very bland product where nobody really thinks about uh, prices because we all know there's something called MSP, which probably increases by four to 6% every year and uh, market prices probably remain at a certain level above that, which is more or less fixed axiomatically based on historical experiences. Suddenly you realize that wheat became a very good commodity for investment, because if you were to trade in uh, wheat futures, unfortunately in India, we have a ban on all these commodities, so you can't trade in wheat, but suppose we had wheat futures uh, trading on the M6 platform, automatically it made sense, it made, a, made a very good investment uh, opportunity for anybody who's looking out to diversify the portfolio. So we've realized that uh, a war conditions can actually be affecting the price of wheat somewhere where uh, our supplies per se were not affected, but just diversion from the government market, that is the FCI to the open market, to the export market, which brought about again a ban in terms of exports, something which the government is replicating also for rice because now there's news that rice production may be down, so therefore there are curbs that are being put on exports of rice. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we see that uh, everything is related to everything. We also saw in case of uh, vegetable oils, once again, if you look at Ukraine, you look at uh, Russia, suppliers of uh, edible oils in the market, once that supply gets cut off, prices go up. In between, we have problems coming from Indonesia, which sell that which felt that they should not be exporting palm oil. Later on, of course, they did agree and then the, the, the exports came through. But then edible oils, which again, unfortunately, are banned in futures trading. But suppose they were permitted, I think there would have been an opportunity for anybody looking out for investment. So the point I'm trying to make is that in the last three years, we've had different cycles of uh, prices, which are being driven by uh, economic conditions, economy is going down, then economy is going up, then an extraneous thing like a war condition. And decisions taken by the OPEC, for example, now OPEC suddenly decides you're going to cut output by 2 million barrels a day, and automatically we see that the price of uh, crude oil, which had actually gone below $90 per barrel, has once again crossed 94 95 I don't know what's the price today, but we're all expecting that it could go up to $100 per barrel. What does this mean? Because if you're looking at commodity trading, commodity as an asset class, I think any asset class thrives when there's volatility in the market. So today when I'm looking at commodities, even for what I would call inane commodities like rice and wheat, we are seeing considerable volatility, not because of supply conditions, but just because of global factors. I think there is a lot of volatility, which means that there is, we are once again into this particular uh, uh, commodity cycle where prices I won't call it a super cycle or anything in that sort where prices are going in one direction, but the prices could go up, they could be coming down. Because today when we are talking of uh, 
uh, we're talking of uh, central banks increasing interest rates to try and bring inflation down. And uh, in the process, what's going to happen is that there's going to be a global economic slowdown. People are talking of the R word, which means recession. If you look at IMF numbers, which came out a couple of days back, we've seen a slowdown in almost all major economies, which means that overall demand for commodities are going to come down, which also means that uh, commodity prices are going to come down. So what we've seen is that in the month of uh, February, March, when commodity prices started going up because of the Ukraine war, we felt that prices are going to keep going up, up and up. And suddenly we saw that from the months of July onwards, prices have started getting tempered down. Now, why have they gotten tempered down? Because I think the market is uh, buffered in the overall impact of the Ukraine-Russian war. We all feel that, okay, they may keep fighting each other for a longer period of time, but in terms of uh, basic economic conditions, how the global globe is going to be affected, it's going to be more or less, everything has been already digested. And we suddenly saw this again, this issue of gas prices going up. Why are the gas prices going up? Because Russia supplies gas to Europe. Now there is a case of saying you know, the turn off the taps and winter months are coming. So therefore gas prices have gone up. So if you have a gas futures contract on MCX, it makes sense to say that, look, there's an opportunity out here. There's an opportunity in crude oil. So there's an opportunity in all, almost all commodity price and all commodities because prices are either moving up or they're moving down. If you look at the soft commodities, you look at your uh, uh, food products, for example, we see that prices have again started moving downwards internationally. Uh, therefore, given to the extent that uh, global prices affect domestic prices, I think we are going to be driven in a similar direction. And today we have seen because of uh, foreign trade, when I say foreign trade, exports, imports, which are generally free across countries. Uh, there is always an opportunity in case there's higher production or there's lower production in any other country where uh, uh, food products, food grains could be actually exported across uh, frontiers, which really means that when these physical activities take place, there's also going to be price effects, there's going to be a lot of volatility in all countries. And that's what makes commodity trading a very uh, a, a, a useful thing for investors to consider. But of course, as what Chandrasekhar has mentioned, one has to be very careful about it because what I'm talking is on hindsight. I'm talking about what happened in 2020, what happened in 2021, what has happened in 2022. So of course, I know that there's been something called lockdown, there's been a global economic, economic recovery, then there's been the war, there's a gas problem which is there, there is uh, an OPEC problem which is there. But how do I actually prophesy as to what's going to happen to the global economy tomorrow? So I think that's where you really need to take a call because when you're getting into invest in commodities, volatility is of course the necessary condition for one to start trading in commodities and try and leverage whatever can be made. But the important thing is that I need to get my do my guesswork right. And doing your guesswork right, forming your conjectures, your forecasts, I think that's where you need to have a lot of knowledge, a lot of information which should be available about what's going to happen in 2022, what's going to happen the rest of 2022, and what's going to happen in 2023. Because I need to know how the global economy is going to perform to form a conjecture about what's going to happen to oil prices, what's going to happen to uh, food prices for that matter, uh, your fertilizers, so energy, other energy products, so everything is going to be hinging on what's going to happen to the global economy. And besides that, I also need to know what's going to happen to the Indian economy. Now, today, for example, we all say that India is the fastest growing economy, which is a fact. IMF says 6.8%, we at Bank of Baroda still stick to 7.2%, but there would be a downward bias. RBI is talking of 7%, Ministry of Finance is talking of 7%. So what does this really mean for commodity prices? And we also know that inflation is very high, it came in at 7.4% yesterday for the month of uh, September. So we all know that the Reserve Bank of India is working hard to control inflation. And we also know that by increasing interest rates, we cannot bring commodity prices down immediately, especially if it's being caused on the supply side. So I need to have a good understanding about why prices are moving in the direction for specific commodities, why they're moving up, why they're moving down. Now, for example, if I look at the food basket of India, We've seen that inflation of pulses is probably very, very low. If I remember right, it's less than 1% it came for September. But you also need to have this uh, knowledge about what are the growth prospects for agricultural crops in the current season. The ministry has already brought out certain estimates. They say that there's going to be lower production of pulses this year, lower production of rice, maybe marginally lower production of oil seeds. 
If you look at private forecasts, of course, there's a big question mark out there. Who are these private players? Do they have any vested interests? But if you look at certain of uh, some of these private forecasts, they say that the government always tends to be a bit optimistic. And if the government says that uh, pulse production is going to be lower by X percent, it's going to be X plus Y percent. So one needs to also have this knowledge about uh, uh, about how overall agricultural production is going to fare, how, what kind of an impact is going to be there on prices, whether there could be possible intervention coming from the government. I think these are the kind of decisions which have to be taken by individuals or by any kind of an investor when you're trying to get into the commodity market. So uh, give a high, high inflation and uncertain situation is the perfect uh, background which you require to consider commodities as an investor, cl invest investor class, uh, investment uh, class. Uh, and even something like gold, which we are talking of, okay? I'm just uh, deviating a little bit. We all know that gold has an inverse relation with uh, the dollar. Now, none of us really know, uh, none of us really expected that the dollar would go below parity. And today it's quoting at 0 0.95, 96, 97 to a euro, something unheard of ever since the euro came into existence. Now, as the dollar keeps strengthening, the price of gold has been weakening. And gold had actually strengthened a lot during the pandemic time. If you remember, we almost touched $2,000 per ounce during 2020. Then after that, there has been a major correction which has taken place. And further correction as the dollar has been strengthening. So when you're getting into dollar, any of these precious metals, we also need to understand what are the fundamentals which drive it. Do I understand the fundamentals? Do I know how the fundamentals are going to behave? Today, as an economist, if you ask me, will the dollar continue to strengthen? The answer is it will, but for how long? I really don't know. Because the moment the Federal Reserve keeps increasing interest rates, the whole idea is to make sure that the US economy slows down. If the US economy slows down, automatically the dollar will have to weaken. So since the Federal Reserve is now, the Fed rate is sorry, at the range of 3 to 3.25%, people are talking of it going towards 4.4% this year, 4.6% next year, that's the median value which the Federal Reserve has indicated. It means there's still a long way to go before the dollar weakens. But when exactly it starts weakening, we really don't know. So if I'm able to get a conjecture, or rather if I want to invest in gold, I need to take a call about how the dollar is going to behave, to know how the dollar is going to behave. I need to know when the Federal Reserve is going to come in. Are they going to increase rates by 25, 50, or 75 basis points? And what's going to be the terminal point? Similarly, I need to understand the American economy. I need to know what is quantitative tightening, which the Federal Reserve has spoken of. Will there be fewer funds out there? And that's something which could actually be driving the value of the dollar. So while prima facie does appear that commodities have become a stronger asset class today, in these inflationary and uncertain times. But the whole question is that, do I know when to enter, when to exit? And I think that's another point which uh, Chandrasekhar has highlighted, that exiting is always an issue. Because even today we know of the stock market, when you're talking about the stock market, at one point of time we were at 60,000, now we are maybe 56, 57,000. The whole question is that if I'm looking to invest in the stock market, I come in at 57,000. Am I sure it's going to be 65,000 at some point of time? Probably yes, but how many years will it take? I really don't know. And for the stock market, of course, it's a bit more difficult because uh, my own analysis shows it's not being driven too much by fundamentals. Probably fundamentals matter in the long term, but otherwise it's sentiment. But when it comes to commodities, you can take a more balanced view, a more uh, a valued kind of a judgment you could actually pass, but for which you need to understand the fundamentals. So I think the important message here is that you need to look at the fundamentals for each and every commodity. The price is being driven by different sets of factors. It's not always a domestic factor which you're looking at. We are not insulated from what's happening at the global level because what happens in the international commodity market automatically gets uh, transmitted to us. Even something like soya, be soya oil prices going up in the international market can be affecting my groundnut oil price, which is not being traded outside India simply because of the fact there's a lot of substitution which takes place because when the price of soya oil goes up, it's quite possible that people may substitute it for with groundnut oil or mustard oil, which we don't uh, import, but that could be having a, a ramification on these uh, prices, on, on, on these prices also. So that's one thing which I wanted to talk of. And the second thing which is very related is that since we are a commodity oriented economy, something which again Chandrasekhar has highlighted, that almost all manufacturing is linked to commodities. I think in this kind of an environment, we need to have companies play a major role 
in terms of hedging. Because uh, one, of course, is that we need to have the contracts. Unfortunately, in India, we've had a ban on several agricultural commodities. So the overall basket of goods which are available for uh, hedging commodity price risk has gotten constricted. But we do assume that it's a short term phenomenon. And at some point of time, uh, we'll have those commodities back for uh, derivative trading on uh, the MCX platform. And uh, one, one, one should be considering that. But at any rate, I think uh, companies need to get into this habit of uh, hedging. Uh, lots of them are doing it on international markets, but you have very uh, vibrant uh, contracts on MCX, especially for metals and energy products. So that's something which one will have to consider because in this kind of an uncertain times where uh, input costs could go up significantly on account of uh, this whimsical movement of commodity prices, I think it's always essential to make sure that uh, companies have a desk which is looking continuously at how prices are moving, what are the factors which are driving. In fact, since I'm talking of metals, I think another surprise factor has been China, because all the time we have seen that China is the country which drives the prices of all commodities, especially of metals, because it's the largest consumer and producer of all metals. And suddenly we see that China has taken a totally different stance when it comes to COVID. After being blamed uh, substantially for the spread of COVID in 2020, it appears that they've become very, very cautious and conservative. And the following uh, zero COVID policy has meant that different points of time, we've had lockdowns being announced. Now, a lockdown, one affects the domestic economy, but it also affects the overall prices of commodities. So we've seen a lot of these prices of metal, uh, metals like copper, aluminium, steel, which have all moved southwards, something which should have been moving northwards, which was the case in 2021 when the global economy was recovering, when China was registering higher growth rates. We've seen that everything has uh, gone wrong. So, uh, that's one of the reasons both in terms of a user of uh, commodities as well as a seller of commodities. So if I'm a steel producer, a copper producer, there is again a case of saying that I need to take certain kind of hedge positions. Of course, I think the internal risk teams will have to debate internally as to what proportion of your uh, product needs to be hedged because there's a cost which is involved when you're dealing in the commodity derivative market. But uh, doing partial hedging of at a time when you expect prices to move up is definitely something which would be advisable, something which will finally help the shareholder. And that's what most companies are, uh, rather all companies are, are, are working for. So I would conclude by saying that in this kind of an uncertain environment where inflation is uh, fairly whimsical, so I'm not really taking a position of saying that it's high or it's low, but the fact that it's swinging up and down itself means that there's a lot of commodity price risk which has entered our system. It's going to remain for some more time. And uh, as someone who's out to look at uh, making investments in different asset classes, commodities are definitely very alluring. Even if you're not an investor, if you're a user of commodities, I think there is definitely a, a very strong case for saying that one should be more active on these exchanges. Maybe if the contract is not there in India, you look at it in national exchange, work out what are the costs of hedging, the cost of operating on any exchange, whether it's MCAs or any of the international exchanges. But I think what's really essential is to take this kind of cover. Because even for next year, if you look at what the IMF is talking of, you're talking of the continuation of the slowdown. In fact, in some sense, one gets is that uh, the so-called recession, which people are talking of quite loosely because the recession is technically negative growth rate. We're not yet talking of negative growth rates, but very low growth rates. But one is expecting that these kind of conditions are going to persist for in 2023 and probably get heightened also. So therefore, there's a very strong case for one to uh, pay a lot of attention to what's happened to commodities, their fundamentals, as well as the price movements, draw up conjectures about how they should logically move and accordingly consider or contemplate uh, entering the market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madan. Absolutely erudite, uh, and very focused. Uh, you've sh shared your thoughts <clears throat> quite precisely. And what is what is what has Madan told us very clearly? Commodities lend themselves to investment, but when you want to invest, be ready to face volatility, benefit from volatility. But you will benefit only if and only if you have adequate product knowledge and market knowledge. That is important. And therefore, you should know uh, the dynamics of the market and the drivers of the market. And, and the second the point he made was those in the physical market, those who have exposure to commodities, 
businesses, corporates, SMEs, whatever, all those various business uh, categories, when they have exposure to uh, commodities, uh, they, it, it is important for them to hedge their prices. Uh, uh, because it, uh, if, 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 if they don't hedge their prices, obviously, they are going to compromise the top line and bottom. Thank you, Madan, uh, uh, once again. Uh, kindly stay back. I'm sure there may be opportunity for a Q&A session if we have the time. I'm not going to invite, uh, I'm not going to invite uh, Nazir, Nazir Ahmad Malvi from MCX to share his thoughts on uh, on uh, the topic. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to be on the panel as you. I've been always a fond reader of your articles and the topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. so thank instead you. of just repeating the uh, content which I've been uh, uh, shared by you and Madan sir, I would directly come to the like expect of what are the products available for investing yes. in commodity derivatives. Just before that, I'll just show you one slide. So recently we have been looking at the news headline saying that uh, the rise in prices are leading to increasing the price of the ultimate good. So earlier, uh, the car manufacturing companies would increase the prices once in a year, but in last couple of years, uh, last two years we have seen the FMCC companies or say uh, auto sector have been increasing the price regularly. So the main reason, reason being is like increasing commodity pass prices, which companies usually tend to uh, hold on for some time before passing it over to the end consumers. So this is a slide which is uh, which I have rebased to 100 of WPI inflation. And uh, since 2006, we have seen the prices have risen almost 40 percent. When we plot our commodity index, which is uh, MCS I complex uh, indices, it shows like our commodity index have been uh, in sync with the rise in WPI rate. So when it shows like if an investor who would have invested also in commodities would have to some extent insulated his, uh, himself from the rising commodity prices. As we have already built a case for say, uh, using commodity derivatives in an investment portfolio, I would not touch on this. I will just directly speak on now the investment opportunities of the products which are available for investing in commodities. The first and foremost uh, product which are uh, there is like say, or traditionally was being used was investing in physical commodity. So for example, a person who would think like, okay, the gold or silver price would increase, or for that matter, copper or any other commodity would increase, they would have just bought it, stored it somewhere and uh, benefited from the rising price. However, there are challenges with holding physical commodities like it are bulk in nature, then you need a space, proper space, then you need insurance, everything should be there to cover your say risk. And that was possible only by the large investors. When we talk about like say individual investors, now these individual investors have multiple opportunities. The foremost now being like commodity derivatives, which are traded on exchanges. Uh, as you shared, like this comes, uh, this also doesn't have a counterparty risk. The added advantage of using commodity derivatives is like uh, you can go not only long, but if you think a price of particular commodity can fall, then you can go also short on that. The Investment opportunities are also arising in the uh, derivative side after the launch of commodity indices. Internationally, commodities could uh, financialize only after the launch of indices. In India, we saw the after the launch of commodity indices, many uh, new investors would have come and joined uh, in this frame. The advantage of investing or buying a futures contract backed by indices is like you are not taking a call on single commodity. For example, I may not be sure. Uh, whether gold will rise or silver. So in that case, as an investor, I may look at buying a bullion index, which is a combination of gold and silver. Similarly, for say other uh, indices like basement index or energy index, or for that matter, some agricultural indices which are traded on uh, domestic exchanges. CB has uh, in past allowed gold ETF. Now what we have seen is like in last one year, uh, CB also permitted silver ETF. After CB permitted, there are a couple of AMCs that have launched silver ETF. ETF gives a very uh, easy and uh, accessible way for investor in, to invest in commodities. Say, for example, if an investor want to put only 500 rupees as a SIP, yes, they can do that with the advent of uh, FOF on, based on the ETF. Another advent, uh, advantage of investing in through ETF is like 
they are just traded like an equity shares on an uh, equity exchange where the prices are discovered or traded on a real time basis and an investor can have an entry and exit at any given point time uh, at any given point of time during the trading hours after mutual funds were allowed to invest in commodity derivative derivatives there are a couple of amcs who have started investing in commodity derivatives so there are schemes like say multi asset fund equity saving scheme who are actively investing in commodity derivatives so again uh, if an individual is not able to find a better way of investing in say different asset class be it equity bond and say uh, uh, commodities then for them a uh, mutual fund uh, probably like say a uh, multi asset fund can be an ideal investment instrument and when we see the performance of this uh, multi asset fund in last two years they have given a decent and uh, good approval compared to many other say uh, peer funds who are not including commodity derivatives another advantage of say investing in say uh, through mutual fund like because mutual funds are run by say uh, uh, for say fund managers who have an understanding a team of fund managers who have expertise in their own domain like for example a, a multi asset fund is being run by three different major say fund managers one who is having expertise in say equity he is focusing on equity side a fund manager who is having expert, uh, exposure or expertise in say handling debt funds he is focusing on debt side and a uh, fund manager who is having a excellence or in say handling commodity derivatives he is focusing on commodity derivatives so an investor who is putting money in mutual funds can take advantage of these three expertise combined in a single instrument then there are something called as alternative investment fund again sebi has permitted this uh, alternative investment funds to also invest in commodity derivatives and uh, there are uh, aifs who are including commodities in their portfolio the advantage of uh, putting money in such aif is like this aif have a flexibility of not only going long and short but also taking a leverage which is not available in case of etfs and mutual funds in india as of date plus uh, when aifs put money in say uh, uh, commodities they can also employ complex strategies which are backed by say their own quantitative uh, uh, techniques which can give a better high return uh, to the investor However, AIFs are not for retail investors because the minimum ticket size of investing in AIF is one crore rupees. So every investor may not have that kind of appetite to put one crore rupees in such funds. Then there is uh, also something called as a sort of, uh, commodity investment through portfolio management services. Unlike mutual fund, where customization is not possible in a PMS form, the uh, customization is yes possible. again uh, you can opt for say you know, having a blend of say different assets uh, in your portfolio depending upon what kind of services your portfolio manager is willing to offer then we have say uh, people can or uh, say look to invest also in say uh, uh, companies who are producing com uh, say commodities like for example if a person may want to take an exposure to metals they may opt to say buy shares of say vedanta vedanta or say hindalpur etc however Uh, in case of say buying uh, equities of commodity producing companies an investor in my personal opinion are exposed to reducing cap rate risk for example uh, though the commodity prices are rising for example copper prices prices may be rising but due to some strike uh, in the company's uh, mind the company prices would fall though the uh, retail investor has gone long over there but he may not be able to benefit from the rising commodity prices so Uh, an equity uh, oriented investment may not give a true exposure to commodities second thing is like commodity producing company may also tend to hedge their price risk when the company is having a price risk the individual investor may not may not get a complete benefit of the upside in commodity prices so uh, in that case uh, when we talk about again about futures i in my personal opinion also believe there is an ESG angle to investing in commodity derivatives as well, because when we are putting money in say com com companies who are producing companies, uh, who are uh, produ producing commodities, they are in putting their investment in say mining the goods where uh, the impacted environments also come into play. However, when you buy derivatives, you are just buying a paper contract, and as we know, like uh, uh, all derivatives contracts are not settled through physical delivery. Uh, the impact on say uh, esg or say uh, buying physical commodity is very less in buying derivatives so 
that's a better way of really investing in uh, com uh, commodities. However, when we talk about derivatives, derivatives have a certain risk attached to that. An investor who say uh, put his money in say derivatives also need to understand or assess his own risk appetite. So, for example, he may buy a uh, contract and uh, the uh, contract may not perform due to the inherent risk. Like for example, he may be along in a side and uh, commodity prices may fall due to some action by the Federal Reserve. So all those things should be kept in mind before an uh, investor puts money in say uh, com uh, commodities. Just, uh, just to conclude what I've been uh, uh, covered by uh, uh, us in the say uh, investing commodities like exposure to commodity help uh, 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 perform a portfolio better because we are putting our eggs not in one basket. However, we are say uh, in, uh, say insulating ourselves from rise or fall in uh, one uh, one asset class. Plus, because we are buying commodities and uh, commodities are closely linked to inflation. Because whenever the inflation rise, uh, it is just because of rising uh, prices of commodities or services. And when we are buying commodities, we are uh, hedging ourselves. Uh, uh, we are insulating ourselves from uh, inflation. Then uh, exposure to different asset class uh, also helps us reduce the volatility. Uh, in our say, studies, we have all uh, heard and read, like uh, the theory called by Henry Markowitz, which says like uh, having different asset class in a portfolio uh, uh, say negates the volatility or the negative impact of uh, each other on the portfolio, which reduces your say uh, uh, volatility and helps your uh, portfolio in a long run. And uh, of course, yes, as I said, it is always better to take direct exposure to commodity instead of say buying commodity producing company stocks. Uh, it can be either through ETF, mutual fund or say AF or derivatives. Yeah, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Nazir, for taking us through your wonderful presentation very well. Uh, uh, you talked about the various products that MCX has to offer, particularly the indices, uh, very, very important. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, and, uh, other slides which actually explain uh, uh, various opportunities for investment. Thank you very much once again. Uh, what I want to mention to this uh, wonderful audience is that uh, commodities are in some way, commodity derivatives are in some way unlike uh, equities. Uh, although the, 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 the nature of trading is, is online trading, the regulator is the same, which is SEBI, all that is fine. The, the point is in case of equities, more often than not, people invest in a particular company, maybe I don't know whether it could be Reliance or LNT, whatever company, uh, put some money, buy shares and kind of forget about it for three months, six months, one year, with the hope that prices will keep, uh, share prices will rise and then maybe they will they will uh, sell it uh, later when the price is actually price actually goes up. But in case of commodities, we don't have that comfort. Commodity prices are volatile. They keep moving up and down very, very regularly. Uh, and, and therefore, um, investors have to be completely <clears throat> sorry, glued to the market all the time and try and benefit from the, from the, from the changes uh, in, in, in prices. And therefore, that calls for a lot more discipline in investing in, in commodity derivatives, much more than what is required uh, in, in case of uh, equities. And therefore, I usually say when you talk of investment, uh, there are four requisites for investment that I talk about. One is capital. You need some money to start trading. Uh, you have to pay uh, your, your uh, um, uh, initial margin. You have to pay mark to market, etc. So some capital is required. Second requisite is knowledge, product knowledge and market knowledge about which we have, uh, we, we, we have talked and that's extremely, extremely important. And uh, the, the, the third one is strategy. That is, when do you enter the market and when do you exit the market? When do you cut your losses? When do you book your profits? So markets are not going to behave uh, as you wish them to behave. And, 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 and therefore you must have your strategy in place. And the fourth one is, of course, discipline, uh, because this is not a market where you can invest and forget about it for six months. No, I think you've got to be, you've got to be uh, uh, absolutely alert uh, to take advantage of the price volatility, etc. And, and therefore, I think these are 
requisites for the for the commodity derivatives market therefore depending on the risk appetite of people and depending on the knowledge that they acquire about about commodities and commodity derivatives i'm sure this is going to be a a, a, a good market for uh, investors to benefit now the we let us have a quick look at the chat box if uh, there are any questions um nazir you also post your email id uh, so that participants can maybe get in touch with you directly anita anita naik also post your uh, your id in the chat box uh, so that the people can write to you directly first question uh, with the current geopolitical issues and unstable economy will the prices of essential commodities increase any any thoughts madan see based on uh, geopolitical tensions i would say that right now it does not appear that there are going to be any major disruptions in the supply chains so therefore i do not expect uh, commodities uh, prices to move in the upward direction except energy prices as, as i mentioned energy prices both crude oil as well as natural gas are the ones which are being driven by geopolitical tensions because even in case of crude oil it's largely felt that what opec has done right now is more in sympathy with russia but of course that's just a view which has been expressed but the fact that uh, they've cut output at a critical time at a time when uh, we are approaching winter where the demand for oil would also increase and definitely countries like europe the countries in europe which are facing a shortage of gas where the gas prices have also increased substantially this year could be looking at substitutes so i'm told they're looking more at coal chandrashekar can correct me out there they're looking yeah. more at coal yeah, rather yeah. than oil but yes at the margin there will definitely be a higher demand out there but in terms of uh, agricultural commodities metal prices i don't think they're going to be affected by the geopolitical tensions as uh, as of now but the china factor is going to continue driving the prices of uh, metals yes. and the physical supplies of agricultural commodities would largely determine the direction of their price move correct very absolutely absolutely mother there is one more question in fact as uh, two related questions will there be global recession in 2023 will india be impacted what about the latest imf report any any thoughts on that yeah see as i mentioned see a recession according to an economist would be a negative uh, growth in yes. gdp correct but based on all the forecasts which have been given by the imf for 2022 as well as for 2023 we don't see too many of these main economies actually showing negative growth but this said i would say that uh, today when people are using the term recession it's used uh, uh, rather loosely yes. to connote a major slowdown in economic slowdown. growth That's right. and the slowdown in economic growth definitely is has is taking place in 2022 in all economies will continue also in 2023 so therefore we will have uh, low economic growth conditions for two successive years 22 23 after a good 21 which came because of a negative uh, base of 2020 this said how would india be affected uh, in my opinion india is basically a domestic oriented economy and our growth prospects are driven by what happens in the domestic economy while we talk a lot about exports but we are definitely not comparable to countries in east asia which are export dependent so their economies are more likely to get affected china gets affected because they are also dependent on exports india at the margin we would be we would be we would definitely be uh, affected but not significantly to disrupt our growth projections so if you look at the pro growth projections for 23 by any of the multilateral agencies it's lower than that of uh, 22 for sure but definitely it's nowhere close to what's happening in the other developed economies we get affected more on account of the slowdown because of the investment flows which could uh, come down so therefore if you're looking at fpis coming into the debt market or the equity market that is something which could be impacted as uh, investors become a bit more wary but even here i think the fact that optically india is one of the best performing economies could still be an attraction for investors who have to put money outside there local territories absolutely uh, thank you very much uh, there is one more thought that uh, that occurs to me uh, of course europe uh, i'm told is actually at the threshold of recession uh, whereas the us we still don't know uh, whether it will be the first quarter or the second quarter of uh, 2023 uh, that will depend on the uh, how hawkish uh, the the fed's stance is and how they're going to raise interest rates 
the market is already factored in 75 BP uh, rate hike on 2nd November, when is the next uh, Fed meeting. Possibly in December, it could be 50 basis point. I mean, these are all conjectures and, and expectations. I There is also a possibility, maybe first quarter, second quarter, next year, the Fed may start reducing interest rates. Who knows if, if the signals of a major slowdown uh, become clear and louder in the US, uh, maybe they will start. So we don't know. We don't know. But there are question marks. But uh, the, the way things are moving, the way inflation uh, is persistent and not uh, coming under control for various reasons, both uh, particularly supply side reasons, uh, uh, but uh, there, there is a possibility and therefore we have to uh, brace ourselves. In fact, uh, I think the IMF and the uh, World yeah, Economic yeah. Outlook has also mentioned that yeah. the biggest challenge for most central banks yeah. is how much do they tighten? Exactly. They cannot over tighten or under tighten. So both exactly. of them, they have to draw a delicate balance. Absolutely. And I'm quite sure that all central banks are also more intelligent than us. And the moment yeah. they see the economy is slumping, they yeah. would also probably reverse it. So people are they saying were... the QE may come back, in fact. Absolutely. Yes, yes, mm. exactly. Uh, well, uh, yeah, possibly. Uh, um, yeah, I, I agree. I think interest rates will drop for sure. Uh, that, 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 that's very uh, that's very clear. Uh, very nice. I think it's very interesting. Therefore, uncertainty. Uh, 2023 is going to be quite, quite uh, or rather uncertain. Uh, and, and we don't know how this war is going to further pan out in, in this quarter till the end of this year. Will it spill into 23? We, we actually don't know. We don't know. I think that, and therefore that uh, that that uh, creates uh, uh, risks and that also creates opportunity. Uh, any, uh, I, I I don't see any other question. Maybe I think we should uh, we should uh, we should wind up this conversation because this can go on for some more time. So uh, any uh, uh, Madan, any any closing remarks that you have, final thoughts that you have in mind, you want to share with the participants. I think just reiterate that volatility yeah. will continue to yeah. stay with us yeah. and uh, we have to be a bit discerning. It will not be the same across all commodity groups. Correct. I think energy, bullion are going to behave in a different manner, driven by yes. different factors. Yes. And agriculture would be probably a bit more saner being driven by yes. supplies, uh, provided there are no further interruptions Correct. coming because of uh, Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think there's been a grain treaty also signed. So yeah. in case, yeah. of course, they revoke it, then once again, there could be problems, but exactly. one has to be watchful of all these factors. Exactly, exactly. Similarly, uh, uh, gold, for example, mm -hmm. has been under pressure for a long time now uh, because of the very hawkish stand of uh, the US Fed. And of course, the absolutely 20 year high uh, dollar uh, is so strong. But once the Fed starts to, uh, to stall interest rate hikes and maybe starts to reduce, I think that will give possibly a big boost uh, to gold. So we, we don't know. I think there, there are a lot of question marks and uncertainties. Uh, Nazir, do you have any, you want to make any very quick uh, closing comments? You have anything before we conclude? So in my personal view, uh, Fed is purposefully raising interest rates to slow down the economy. Yes. So they don't want to be, look like a developing uh, or underdeveloped country like yes. where inflation is persistently high for in double agent. Yeah. So probably once they are able to control the inflation, they will reverse it. And based on the what mm -hmm. uh, Fed minute last which I read was, uh, they want to add on the, uh, say, uh, predicting that inflation will exceed their expectation rather than, say, being complacent. So we can see uh, more tightening coming in. Okay. The time they are able to completely control inflation. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madan. Thank you, uh, Nazir, for uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, I want to thank all the participants, of course. I hope uh, I hope this discussion uh, was of some value uh, and some education. Uh, there's some take home messages. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, uh, thank IMC team, Anita Naik and the IT team of IMC for uh, for putting all this together. Uh, with this, we'll conclude. Good luck, God bless you all. IMC will keep keep uh, communicating with all the participants. We do a large number of events from time to time. Uh, and uh, we will keep communicating. Anita Naik will keep sending circulars to, to everyone and do participate uh, in, in these uh, uh, interesting events on, on commodities and commodity derivatives. Thank you very much. God bless. We'll conclude the event now. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thank you.